Take a breath, step outside. Yato, yate, as we say here in the w Southwest, in the Navajo way, we say hello in a good way to all of you beaming in this evening. Thank you so much for joining us. This evening, we have a wonderful guest. We'll get to that in just a moment. Indigenous Ways always wants to acknowledge the traditional owners of the country throughout Turtle Island and pay respects to their elders past and present. And we'd also like to take this time to acknowledge traditional owners and ancestors of these lands we reside on in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Uh, there's 19 Pueblos on and around us. Pueblo people, wherever you are, thank you for having us on your land. And we'd also, also like to acknowledge the traditional owners and ancestors of the lands you all are beaming in from so that we could all be here today and uh, Indigenous Ways is dedicated to bridging cultural exchange with people globally. And for that web, through social media, we are grateful. So this evening, uh, we're going to acknowledge that we are at the actual one year anniversary of hosting Indigenous Ways virtual events. We can't even believe it. We thought we were going to do this for a month or two. Guess what? We're still here every Wednesday without fail and every third Saturday without fail. We also have an indigenous performer or comedian coming in. So we've been able to support over 85 presenters and our beautiful ASL interpreters have been diligent and persistent and committed to the message to bring to our indigenous and all others deaf and hard of hearing families and audiences. So thank you, all of you for making this a reality called virtual reality. I can't even believe it. The new buzzword is the new normal. I don't like that. I'd like to find something more creative than that. But we'll talk about that later. If we have time, I'd like to get on with our show and introduce Dr. Gabriel Tayak. And what I want to say about Gabriel is first off, we met her when we were in DC. Me and Elena were playing as in DigiFem in a little hole in the wall called the Electric Maid. And lo and behold, Gabby and Judy Shapiro showed up and we became really lifelong friends from that evening at Electric Maid. We will always play at Electric Maid because of our gratitude for knowing Gabby and Judy. So, Dr. Gabrielle Tayak, she is a member of the Piscato Piscataway Indian Nation. Gabby is an activist scholar committed to empowering indigenous perspectives. Gabby earned her PhD and MA in sociology from Harvard University and her Bachelor of Science in Social Work and American Indian Studies from Cornell University. Her scholarly research focuses on hemispheric American Indian identity, multiracialism, indigenous religions, social movements, and maintaining a regional specialization in the Chesapeake Bay. So to get us started, Thank you for being with us, everybody. Welcome, Gabby. Hey. <laughs> hey, so good to be with you. That's quite a beautiful bio you've got there, Gabby. So if you can tell us your family history, where would you start? Well, you know, I'd also like to to give a, a greeting and send um, greetings and good feelings all around. Um, you know, sometimes with the bio, right? It's it's all of these these titles and and things that we've done, and we're just ourselves, right? So, so just just ourselves, and um, good to good to be speaking out across the waves to all the Tewa and Pueblo lands that you you fit with. So really to. Um, start in the family histories, um, you know, as a historian, <laughs> we can go back so far and um, spend that, but it's really important, right? Because we, we really are um, all of these 
parts and pieces and we come to being whole people. And I think that that's a really important thing for us to understand that with all of the, the threads that we carry with all of the energies and ancestors and um, stories that we have um, within us, we are a whole being, you know, unto, unto ourselves. So thinking about, um, you know, family histories, probably um, the best way for me to describe it. And I haven't really thought about this until you asked me this question tonight um, in this way, is, is that I think that my family history would start with the Atlantic. Um, my family history really starts in so many ways with, um, with the waters mm. of the Atlantic and where they touch um, shore to shore and where they also come from. Um, the inside to the outside. And I say that because um, through my father's side, um, my family begins in a place that's called the mother of waters, the great shellfish bay, that's known as the, the Chesapeake Bay. And um, you may also know this as the state of Maryland on the East Coast. Um, our lands also touch into Washington, D.C. And these are tide waters that, that um, my father's side of the family um, is from and where, where I've lived and I felt called back to. And then my mother's side of the family um, starts in Russia and um, comes across to New York. So I'm a very, you know, in many ways, a very blended um, person and I've had to think quite a bit about where that all fits and that's why I talk about the whole so coming from um, my mother uh, who is a Russian Jewish woman um, to my father um, who was a Piscataway man um, and then uh, that's really that's really where it starts and there are many um, many many stories of of how they knew who they were and how they transmitted that to me um, so that's where my, my family um, stories start. Um, they cross through um, New York City and they come back to me um, coming home into the tide waters. And actually Piscataway, um, the, the translation of Piscataway is where the waters blend. And so I really take that to heart of of you know these of the waters blending and and carrying them and and recognizing them and and really being um settled into 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 myself uh so those are the the that's kind of the intergenerational a uh, long intergenerational consciousness that um that I would carry as well as a beginning that's really interesting how there's all these different DNAs that come together ancestrally to make specifically you, your fingerprint, your footprint that ultimately you will leave on this planet. And that is just so beautiful in how you're walking on this planet and the information that you're choosing to put your attention to and sharing. So the next question that I wanted to ask you is, uh, first of all, thank you for sharing that information with us to give us a basis of who you are and some of your cultural foundations. I know in this world, degrees and education are so important, labels, uh, cards, and underneath your name, everything you've been and everything you've done, and it informs and gives direction and leads to I don't know, employment, wonderful contacts. Uh, how does your educational background inform your understanding, sharing and preservation of the knowledge that comes to you, not just from your oral family traditions that have been handed down from your great grandparents, but also from all the vast array of information you get from your education research. And then of course, I know you've got uh, quite extensive context and museums and so forth. So I, that's kind of a pretty broad que question, but I'll just let you run with it. Yeah, you know, um, I think for so many of us, um, it's, it's always this question of how do we, how do we, how do we balance those things out? Where, where does it fit? I would say, um, you know, for me, um, it was 
it was really an understanding of first listening very, very carefully to family, um, to elders. I was, you know, the little kid who would sit and listen, you know, the little kid who sits and listens and loves being with older people, <laughs> loves being with, with, with older people and, um, and, and being with, with grownups and elders and um, sitting for hours and hours and listening to stories. Um, and also having the understanding, two things, maybe two things, and there's probably more, but just two coming to mind right now. Um, one is um, coming from such a small uh, East Coast tribe, um, it was very clear that you may be the only person who will pay attention or no, like you can't necessarily um, depend on the idea that somebody else will will carry a story, you know, because in on my um, dad's side, we came down to my grandfather, um, who was a, a, a medicine person, he was a herb doctor. Um, and he was the last practitioner of that tradition. Um, and so you can never, ever, ever take it for granted that somebody else is going to do that. I also know um, that you know, my own existence, right? As so many of us uh, who come through these um, genocidal um, histories and histories of erasure, that um, there is, and I've always taken this really carefully, really very, very seriously, very heavily, very seriously, that um, that if, if there's an opportunity to take, um, to be able to transmit those stories and tell it the best that I can um, for all the people who couldn't make it to speak, to all the people who didn't get here, you know, for all the all the people who were who were silenced or who didn't make it or kids didn't make it, right? Mm -hmm. So, so there was this real serious feeling of of having that um, that responsibility um, that I took on as a as a very young. I took it on as a very, I was, I was kind of serious. I took it on as a very young person. And so um, having the possibility, I felt that, you know, I'm not a physically very strong or coordinated person. I'm, I'm not, you know, uh, I'm somebody who's like kind of studious, right? Kind of, ner you know, nerdy in and, and a lot of ways. And so the question was, is that I knew that my father had been denied um so much of um because of of who he was because of the extreme crushing racism of the south um that that if i had the opportunity to study um and do the best that i could um not to be in competition but in order to to get those stories told and so i always took that path and i was very direct about um wanting to um, be able to go into uh, a field that I could not be the person that, you know, tells, tells a story, but opens the, the space, opens the space. So if I could do that, right, because of the opportunities that, that I had, um, then it was really a way to transmit um, for so many people who have been, which is terrible, right? Like less validated, like let's let's open that door. So when I had that opportunity to, uh, I really put my eye on, uh, there was an American Indian program and there still is a strong one at Cornell, which is very Haudenosaunee um, oriented, but they had known um, the family because the family is, is very, uh, very activist. Um, my my fa family is a very activist family. Um, so I was coming out of New York and I said, you know, I really, I really want to be in a place where I can study and learn um, as much Native history as I can and, and bring it forward as much as I can and work with the oral history. And I want to know how to do that. I, know, I want to know how to do that really as well as possible. And also um, advocate for our human uh, and, and Native rights and um, get into those spaces maybe where people could listen. And then again, just open that space through the page, through what I could say. I'm naturally actually a very shy, I'm a very shy person. And, um, you know, kind of, so I can have to force myself. And so I did. 
And um, that's really where those, so that's where the, the impetus for the degrees um, came from was to say, let's see how I can go forward and, and open that up and study and have the opportunity because also of you know elder scholars, native elder scholars before us who, who established native studies um, so that we don't only have to work with um, you know dead white men, although you know they can be very interesting to study. I'm learning this, so I'm actually kind of interested in them right now. <laughs> but what did they do? Like what exactly did they do? So so those are so those are the ways that I think that there's there's that piece but really that's been um that's been the track that i've been on i'm 53 now um and to be able to understand what happened to us um how to make sure that our oral traditions and and our elder stories could be uh considered um at the same level if not more than um the uh, historians that are are generally more respected. So that's why I, I made a run on Harvard because I figured I was like, if I could do that <laughs> and, and get in there. But also what I found along the way is that um, it does help to be able to access all of this material, right? Like not, not just the doing the oral, but also really learning how to how to um, access that material and then um, have it be taken um, more seriously. It shouldn't be that way, um, but you know, it was it was just a, a it was just a road that I took, and uh, it's been a it's been a very interesting one of the mind and and to be able to understand um, knowledge carriers from from so many different directions and also um, not just from, from uh, English speaking colonized areas, but also um, further to the South and Central and South America where there's also a great deal of indigenous scholarship going on. So. Wow, and that brings to mind that there's a delicate um, approach, I would imagine to visiting so many different knowledge carriers and how to be the liaison uh, between that and even moving stuff from um, site to site, uh, from a, a site, for example, into a museum and what kind of repercussions come up with that. And some, I'm sure there's some communication breakdowns that happen with uh, uh, misappropriation and and uh, knowledge and stuff like that, that I imagine you have to walk very delicately in such a way with uh, the collective culture versus the individual culture. And yeah. like, a, I'll use an example, a Native American anthropologist and a non-Native American anthropologist, what are some of their guiding principles on how they approach um, discovering some of our ancient artifacts. Pretty intense. Very intense, very intense. And the the work that um, I had done at first with when, in regards to the museum was actually protesting, um, protesting on the outside, um, working towards repatriation, return of remains. Um, from our burial grounds, about a thousand human remains were taken out by Smithsonian, they're still there. Um, so, so this is a viewpoint of how could I ever, um, go to work for a museum ever. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, you know, it was one of those questions, like, how did that happen? And it was, um, it well, it was National Museum of the American Indian. And I did ask the question, um, when they wanted me to come in, um, to take a job. And I just said, you know, I, I, I don't know if I could work for an institution that's holding my ancestors captive. Ooh. And uh, so the conversation at NMAI was that they had deaccessioned all of the human remains and it was about um, living voice um, in connection to the, to the people. So it, that's not, so at National Museum of the American Indian is for example, part of 
Smithsonian and each place has it, some of its own, um, own policies. So I, I thought, you know, um, in order to amplify these stories and, and tell it from a particular way, but I'll tell you one of the first, very first things that happened um, when I when I got the job, there was a um, there was a group of um, people from I'm trying to remember, but it, they, it was like around the country, um, Native people coming in to um, to to Smithsonian and uh, our museum folks were hosting people, I think for a lunch. And the very first question, it was, I think it was like my third day on the job. And um, one of the women um, who was from, I think from the Southwest, you know, looked at me and she said, you, you stole our, our ancestors, you know? And so then I, I thought, wow, mm. yeah, okay. So now I've taken on this, you know, mantle of, of working, um, for, you know, working for Smithsonian, um, and having to figure out how to, how, how to work with that and how to address that and how to think about it, right? Like we see people who, like you said, walking that, walking that fine line, um, what has happened more and more is that when you are in these roles uh, with like, for example, degree carriers or working at museums and working in, in academic fields is that it puts us enough um, on the inside sometimes to be able to very pointedly, uh, blatantly hold uh, people accountable. We then have also worked quite a lot to, to change uh, what these fields are and so to be able to teach them on our own terms, like I'm teaching right now a oral history a seminar um, to graduate students, history students, and they absolutely must center indigenous voice. They have to. Yeah. So it's part of their training um, that that being there makes that happen it's not without its its issues and i know that we we talk about this all the time but when you're speaking about for example having a native person uh, who's an archaeologist or an anthropologist or a sociologist it means that what what we're able to do now i think after a couple of generations maybe about two two three generations of of having native scholars and policies like nagpra and people in in places where we have to be able to say that it can only be done with consent. It can only be done in a way that respects cultural um, understandings and that it, it has to be, those ethics have to be driven by uh, native people and native, um, native knowledge holders. And, and of course, you know, working, working across so many different places too, I, I never go in and assume that I know. Like, I, I, you know, I just never go in and assume that I know um, what other Native people, what other tribal people are going to think. So always go in with a lot of humility um, and understanding and just listen. Um, you know, what is it that, that we need to do to support you? I can't come in, um, you know, as a Native person from a very particular experience and understand something. So I always try to, you know, give when, when I've worked with people all across the country and hemispherically, um, always go in with, with, a, with, a, with as much humbleness and listening as I can and give time to, um, you know, never push it, right? Because um, my understanding, it's basically to just have that sense that I, that, that I never understood I could never just speak for somebody else. I have to sit and listen. Um, and then again, open spaces for people. So we have the advantage in, in, in uh, DC that so many people do come um, to, to, the, to DC. So we get a chance to meet people from so many places. I think I might've, I think I might've first met you when you came, you, I think you came to our burial grounds with, with oh, Beverly Lily and Kathy. Sanchez and um, we all did Tewa Women United uh, hosted, yeah, sponsored Women us United. and brought us in with them. 
Yeah. So, you know, having people um, and then you have that established relationship to say, look, I'll, you know, we're here to host you and walk with you so that sometimes, sometimes, you know, I can go someplace and somebody knows, but a lot of times people have no idea. Right. So I just go out and, um, and just try to take people on their own terms um, and, and listen to what, to what their, to what their needs and, and concerns are, you know, because that's not my, that's not my story. Um, it's maybe a conduit to be a story. So having that approach and, and that, and that respect and, and also that feeling of, you know, it's, it's, it's always love. Yes. Really. Yes. Beautiful. That is so awesome. Well, thank you very much for walking as one. Nobody in front, nobody behind, nobody above, nobody below. All of our voices, all of our spirits, all of our blood running red is one with the breath, ultimately. Ya mm -hmm. at e, ya, universe all, at e, is. Mm -hmm. That's us. So I was watching a uh, Dalai Lama uh, speak the other day and Buffy St. Marie asked him how we address uh, all the missing and murdered indigenous women that have largely, a lot of the cases have largely been neglected and not acknowledged and not completed and closed case. And he said, what's happening now is we're on an old story that's a thousand years old and that's the patriarchy. He mm -hmm. said, you notice women are coming into roles that are traditionally what the last thousand years have known as a man's role he said but we we have to have these women continue to come in not only to save your humanity but to save the planet because the women have more compassion he said that's why we need more leadership in this world because the compassion is to be brought in with the science with the the prayers the religions the spiritual practices and the woman have that more so than the men. That was really a beautiful statement that he made, and I will always remember that. Mm -hmm. So um, can you talk about, I'm really curious coming from the Southwest, all around me is brownness. I mean, brown dirt, red dirt, there's yellow dirt, black dirt, right, Beverly Billy? There's all kinds of clay all around us here on the Pueblo lands. Um, and there's also a lot of brown skinned people around too in the Southwest, it's just, that's the majority here in Santa Fe, which is really beautiful why I stay around a lot. What I'm curious is to hear about, because I haven't heard it from one of you, the voice of the people, is the impact of colonization in your parts of the country as compared to the rest of the U.S. Because I know the Navajos still speak the language. They still have the ceremonies. And some people have amalgamated Christian principles and still practice Navajo ways and have taken certain parts of ceremonies out, have kept others in. The woman's rite of passage seems to stay with the Kinalda and those types of things. But the point is, is uh, talk to us about that. Because I know you guys were like the, I think you were the first hit, right? So yeah, we were hit, I think, in the late 1700s. Yeah, um, I also want to thank you for sharing that um, the beautiful um, meditation on on uh, murdered and missing Indigenous women, and you know, and I think that kind of frames us right. And and this Brown Earth, I have to say, the times that I've come out uh, your way, I I was uh, with there's a, an artist named Nora Naranjo Morris who I had a chance to work with quite a bit, and I think it was like I after I spent time with her, I was like. Wow, you really, when you talk about the earth, like you see it, like you're on it. It's <laughs> like, I was like, I'm never going to walk on the ground ever the same way, even if it's under all this concrete and grass and everything. So, so, you know, um, yes, uh, our people here were hit very early, um, actually about six, 1565, um, by 1607, the English came and they did not leave. Hmm. So, you know, there was not like a, like a touch in and go. This was like, they did not leave. Um, and not only did they not leave, but here is 
this is what I, I think with all this vast history of what it means um, to be on the, on the Atlantic uh, seaboard. In 1607, right, you have um, what was called Jamestown, John Smith, uh, who was not like so cute, not that he's so cute necessarily in the Disney movie either, um, with the woman named Pocahontas, who was an 11 year old a uh, girl named Matoaka, who's just down the river from us. So that's really our, our area. Um, by 1619, the first enslaved Africans also came here. Mm. So these, these kinds of the way the colonization hit here and stayed in an, is an it's an Anglo, it's an English colonization, which is very obsessed with blood purity, mm. even though the reality is not the case. So by, um, for us, by 1712, um, we already uh, had been missionized. In Maryland, we were actually a Catholic colony. So our, our Piscataways are unusual that we're uh, Catholic, Catholic converts and from 1640. Um, and then you had, you had, missionization, removals, epidemic diseases, militias and military, um, you know, mass death, treaty making, uh, the whole thing over a hundred years. Our first hundred years is, is by 1712. So what happens next? You know, some of our people did leave, went up into Pennsylvania, went out, ended up out west, but our folks, we stayed. By 1719, the people that stayed, um, there's something that's, that is distinctive here that I think is, is different. Um, and that is, is that we were subject to race law. Mm. And enslavement laws, um, it, like, because, it was, you had um, a lockdown of intergenerational um, African-American chattel slavery, um, which also included some native people. And then our people who were left as like an island, an island of people um, and stayed that way for about 300 years. So it's, it's really, you know, there's, there's this long, long history about, you know, even on the Atlantic, it's even, um, you know, when you read about like King Philip's War, Wampanoags on the, yes. up on the, you know, we're all part of this kind of like first hit Atlantic yep. peoples. And that's even like, by the time you get to, like people think about like Haudenosaunee Mohawk as East Coast, but that's, they didn't get fully taken over till the American Revolution by se the 1780s. So oh. we're like, you know, it's it's a long, it's a long, long haul. And even early, so early that we're not even like um, picked up, you know, by by the time, you know, the Bureau of Indian Affairs or in the Department of War is set up and U.S. treaty making is made. Our treaties are from the 1660s. That's what I was going to ask. What, what yeah, we have a treaty. Our treaties are from from the 1660s and 1690s. Um, we, I think, uh, Piscataway has probably. We, we think it might be the first reservation, 1651. Wow. Of Chaptico. Mm, wow. And and you know what? That was 200 years more than the Navajos. But on it's the long a walk. long time. And here's the thing about our community, because I started mapping us all out. Wow. Our families still live within the confines of the old reservation. Wow. It's is that that is that where you took us for the prayer gathering? That, that that's a little farther up. Like we got pushed. So like I, I tell my kids, like we got thrown out of the most beautiful places <laughs> like you know so we got pushed down to like where the where the where the Indian mission was just further down so our people our families still live within the boundary lines 
of the original land patents. Wow. Because everybody else came in. Wow. Everybody else came in. Mm -hmm. And so like our people, I was saying, you know, by the 1680s, I would have to say either through love or through force. Mm -hmm. um, there were already um, marriages and interrelationships with, with Black people and with white people. And hmm. then that got locked down. So like our, our history is very, um, you know, it's kind of distinctive, but in a way like everything that was tested out that ended up happening further out West, you can see it start um, with, with our people, with Wampanoag people, with Powhatan people, um, Narragansett, Lenape people, you know, first hit people. So those, those like same processes, you know, within a hundred years, cause I was thinking about it by the time you get to, um, you know, the formation of the United States, um, you have the war of 18, sorry, we got the war no, of 18, no, no. No, but no, like, I'm just good. saying like, like you have, um, by the time the U S gets set up, when's the war of 1812, just think about this. Um, Within 20 years, you have Indian removal by, by the 1830s. By 1849, they're out in California and then they come into the middle. They come into the middle by like, all within the space of a hundred years once the US is set up. So when we're talking about like what happens like out on the East Coast, the hold off for about a hundred years and then like another couple hundred years, um, it, it, you know, things, things go in, in a very particular way. Um, and so, so the, the longevity, and that's also, I want to say, you know, for, for, for people that are, are further out to the West, um, where, you know, the U S or, or, you know, states were developed, like, I was like, wow, Arizona, like, wasn't even like a state until I'm still Mexico but, then. Yeah, right. I mean, so, so the, the thing is, is that, um, yes, uh, a lot of our languages um, are pretty decimated, um, are, you know, you can look at, yeah, there's a tremendous amount of loss, but we are still on the lands that love us. Yay. You know, we Glad still you survive, have, right? Like still have, you know, the, even the, the, sometimes that's what I say to people. They're like, oh, there's so much else. I was like, yeah, but think about it. I'm like, this is I'm like this 400 years. It's a long time. And, um, you know, we're still here and working on, on recoveries. And what it meant was, you know, it's not just the big things, but, you know, you're thinking about the women, right? Like somebody gets up every day and and makes a decision you know somebody got up every day for 400 years and um took care of their family and protected their family and then did what they had to do you know and and held on and held on and held on um until this very moment you know tosh where we can have this conversation and i can tell you my name and i can tell you where i am and we can come back, you know, together. I'm like, somebody got up every day for 400 years. So this could happen. Thank so you. That, you know, it's absolutely. That, yeah. Well, I was talking to my mom every day, but yesterday in particular, and my mom says, wow, you turned out to be pretty all right. You and your sister. I'm proud of you too. I said, mom, it's because of you. You got up every day and made sure that we got three meals a day that our lunch boxes were packed. Mm -hmm. We went to the school and you threatened me to sign me up for showers if I didn't take my bath. So she's like, <laughs> oh, so I had something to do with that. I'm like, yeah, mom, it's absolutely you. I mean, you're the, the matriarch of now Black Mountain now that our Masana has passed on June 8, uh, mm -hmm. 2020. Grandma lived to be 98 and now the Buck is passed to my mom. She's the Black Mountain Oak Ridge woman, the matriarch of our mountain. So thank you for joining us tonight, mom. 
The last question we have time for this evening is, I have a couple of more questions, but unfortunately I want to bring a lot of, uh, not a lot, but I want to bring some special people in. Sarah Young Bear is here from the Meskwaki Nation. I want her to talk to us in a minute. Judy Shapiro's here, my mom, my sister, uh, some other people. So can you talk to us about um, some of the positive and negative aspects of anthropology and museums, just really briefly? Yeah, real briefly, um, negative colonialism, okay? Like negative colonialism, extraction, all of that, uh, terrible, like we know this. Um, let, me, let me talk about the turn. Um, the turn uh, is, is that uh, the idea for, for us to be able to um, have, have some things that are there uh, and to develop policies so that, so that Native people um, have access and can tell stories and perhaps, you know, um, bring things back. I think Native Indigenous museums, Indigenous repositories, um, Indigenous archives, that's a that's a very important way to go in terms of looking at you know how do we how do we curate as as sovereign I'm, I've been working on this idea about how do we hold and carry knowledge for a sovereign generation it's a sovereign generation that we're working with now and that's the the pathway that that we've had so you know positive with museums it's it's the actual pieces from um, our ancestors or from, from our contemporary creatives and to be able to work with them in a very uh, sensory way. The point is, is that, you know, those, those, those objects, those ancestors, those family members that are, are in material, um, how, do we, how do we bring them, you know, so that they make sense and so they belong where they need to be. And I think that that's the kind of um, consciousness and work um, where we're going now. Beautiful. And lastly, our theme this year is thriving in purpose. What does this mean to you in this time? Mm, thriving in purpose. What a what a powerful thought and a theme. And I think it means not. It's it's so beyond um, survival. It's about. Uh, setting out, setting out that vision, and uh, bringing back the concept that that joy is life too, you know, and and that uh, how are we able to to transform and and not just protect and heal, but how do we how do we transform? And I think that that's a that's such an important um, piece is is that that we we can be part of this beautiful, powerful life source that we fought so hard for that we also deserve this joy that's taken me a very long time to get to, um, a very long time to get to. Um, beautiful. That's, that's important. Awesome. Thank you very much. Well, I want to take this time to tell everybody this show is being recorded. Those of you that are going to be watching it in the future, thank you for joining us. Those of you here with us tonight, thank you for joining us. Those of you on social media streaming in, thank you for joining us. I'd like to invite all of you to come in if you feel like it, if you want to just be seen, if you want to say hello to uh, Gabby, please uh, unmute your microphone and say hi. Uh, we've got uh, Australia, Jody Aranda. Hey, Jody, thank you for coming in, mate. Uh, hello, everyone. Very interesting. This is our Aussie mate. And then we have uh, Baltimore, Maryland, Jennifer Faloyan. Very interesting. Amen. Uh, so it is. Uh, Singapore, Kathy Luke Chow. Thank you for this education. All right, that goes to you, Gabby. And Angelina Owillo is saying, I love you, Gabby. She's our speaker next week. She's our beautiful sister that's going to be uh, presenting next week. So everybody join next Wednesday for Angelina Owillo, deaf sister. Let's start with Beverly Billy. Hey, Beverly. Hi, how's it going? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, really good. This is for okay. Gabby, I think. Oh, okay. yeah. Hi, oh. Gabby. Wow. Oh. My heart is so full. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for giving. Thank you for all your hard work. I just wanted to tell you, uh, I seen, I see, I see, I see you. And 
I also wanted to tell you, I see your daughter. What a beautiful young lady and an activist herself. Um, mine is doing the same thing. So, you know, it's good hard work and we got to be there for them, right? And yeah. we planted that seed. So much power to you and um, just happy birthday because you mentioned how old you were. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so good to see you. <laughs> you know, having your footsteps with you and being able to connect through social media. And, and it's just thank you so much. Oh, what a treat. You're wow. welcome. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Bev. Sure. We love you, Bev, your whole family. Okay. Let's go on to Judy Shapiro. Hey, Judy. Hey there. Hey. Hey. So, hi, Gabby. I haven't seen you in a couple of weeks. <laughs> <laughs> we they live in the same town. About a half mile apart from each other right now. Mm -hmm. a very hard bridgeable half mile this year <laughs> <laughs> washington dc everybody yeah she just lives a few blocks from me so she just like this has been part of like keeping sanity like uh judy's like i'm walking by your house i'm like okay i'll come to the fence <laughs> <laughs> yeah Important. You know, we, we've you had a lot of really good conversations but this is the first time i've heard you talk in depth about your folks believe it or not. And that was very powerful for me. Um, you know, I've spent the last, I don't know how many years living with the history of Eastern tribes in the United States. And so it's not unfamiliar, but it's just so much coming out of your mouth and out of your heart mm -hmm. and, and very important for me to hear. And thank you. Thank you. You've done so much, just incredibly important work uh, to support our communities. Really appreciate you, everybody. For your information, Judy's an Indian lawyer. She's a lawyer for Native Americans. She's right here with us tonight. Thank you for your walk, Judy. Uh, we'd like to just quickly acknowledge Donna A. Donna says to you, Gabby, thank you, thank you. Such an important story to share. Um, and Christine McDewitt, thanks, thank you so much. Very powerful teaching. So uh, our two sisters here tonight. I would like to acknowledge our little sister, Cody, Lakota. How you doing, little sister? Would you want to say something? Hey. Um, yeah, I was just texting it. <laughs> and uh, But I just want to thank you for your talk. Um, it was, it's really interesting um, to see how far you, you've came. That's a really um, strong and brave journey to come out of your shell and then be an advocate for um, all those artifacts and figures that are behind the walls and in the drawers. And, you know, um, it's time for a lot of them to be seen and be heard. And you get the opportunity to bless them every day with, uh, you know, taking out an object here, there. Um, but that, that right there is my dream. <laughs> um, I would love to see um, old artifacts and, and especially when they're preserved, it's always a wonder who's taking care of them and how, and um, it's just nice that to hear your journey. So thank you. Thank you, Cody. When you're, um, or anybody, when, when, you, when you're ready to, to, to come out our way, let, let me know. And okay. um, so, yes, you can like have visits with the ancestors too. Absolutely. Thank you. Beautiful, Cody. Thank you for that. And we got a comment from our brother, David Gomez. He says, I think it's interesting natives are becoming an emerging presence in museum studies and curation. Would you like to say anything to that, Gabby? Oh, hey, hi, David. Um, yeah, we, it, it's, it's really um, essential, it is critical um, for, for indigenous people. And this is a lot of powerful work actually being done in the Pacific as well. Um, to be able to um, take care of and, and work with, with our own uh, ancestors and ancestor, am, ancestor objects, knowledge, um, really important field to go into in every level. So I uh, thank you for that comment. Thank you for that beautiful question. And let's go on to our beautiful uh, sister, Annette from Albuquerque. Annette, would you like to say anything? I just wanted to say thank you to the speaker and thank you for allowing me to talk. I, you know, I, I get a lot of, a lot of um, 
inspiration from all your the speakers you have and it's just like uh, with this one i i understand a lot of the stuff and it's just um thank you for allowing me to just uh share a little bit but um thank you to the speaker i really appreciate it thanks thanks annette thank you very much we're so glad you're here with us and uh, let's go to our beautiful sister, Arletta. And it looks like you got Rodney with you, Arletta. Rodney's the R on the hand. Rodney. Hey, Arletta, what's up? Luca Chukai hailing in. The miracle house with a signal. Yay. Yeah, it was incredibly interesting, that presentation. So fascinating. You know, and, and keeping up with what's happening within museums and, and you holding them accountable. Just thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's really nice to see you and and also to um, know that, that there are people that are out there supporting because uh, sometimes we don't, you know, we know, we know um, the communities are there, but to be able to see you and, and, and reach you, I, I so appreciate you. We do our best. Awesome. Thank you for your um, uh, question. Hello, Arletta and Rodney. Uh, Lena's looking forward to seeing you all Sunday. Okay, we're going to take a really quick commercial break here. Guess what? We got some exciting stuff happening. Oh my God. I'm going to pass it over to this beautiful, smiling Pacific Islander here. Thank you so much, uh, Gabby, and blessing us in the circle. Uh, your incredible walk of uh, what you have been doing uh, has just been beyond uh, extraordinary. Uh, thank you for sharing uh, what you have uh, is a great gift uh, for all of us. Uh, anyway, it's my job to do the wonderful commercial break. And uh, this Saturday, which is the third Saturday of the month, we're going to be blessed with blues uh, singer songwriter Pete Sands, who's Dene. He's going to be coming and sharing in the concert series uh, at 3 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. It's the same address uh, as you're in at the moment if you want to see him live or it goes blasting out to all our wonderful networks. Uh, you know, the stories uh, and experiences that uh, Gabby shared with us, that's going to be available in our archives on our web website, indigenousways.org, in the next 48 hours. Uh, you can, if, if you wanted to hear more, because there was a lot of incredible information uh, to digest, you can go there, watch it again, share it with your friends. As Tash said, we are in uh, one full year, one cycle around the sun. Uh, we've been beaming out, bringing the Indigenous Ways virtual events to you through the Wisdom Circle every Wednesday and also through the third Saturday of each month. All of these are free and all of them have uh, ASL interpreters and that is to ensure that uh, access is available for everyone so we're very very grateful uh to that and uh for that and thank you uh to our sponsors uh this time round, which is the native american uh, advice fund also new mexico arts and uh west staff and the community the santa fe community foundation also, we would not be able to do this without your individual donations keeping us here. Also supporting over 85 Indigenous, Native American, deaf and hard of hearing and LGBTQIA artists, musicians, presenters that we've been very blessed for the last year uh, to have through. And we shall continue on with this because the most important thing for us is that we stay connected during this time. Below me, uh, you will see all our social uh, media links. If you are watching us live at the moment and you haven't done this, please subscribe or like uh, to one of those pages. Share this 
Uh, it's really important stuff. Also, again, at our website, we have our newsletter, which goes out weekly. So if you want to see or hear what's going on, please subscribe uh, to that. Now, uh, Tash was saying earlier, we've been doing relief runs. It's only been possible because of this platform. We've been very, been very blessed because of you, not only to be doing our 10th run, which is to the deaf and hard of hearing this Sunday, uh, but also going up to Black Mountain, where Tasha's family is from. Uh, this will be our 10th uh, run. Um, and I think our third run to the deaf and hard of hearing community. This is only ever possible because of you. So since May last year, we've been able to do this. Thanks to you, we've um, been able to, and this platform, we've been able to uh, have over $150,000 come through to help uh, all these beautiful people in these communities. Thank you so much for making that possible. We'll be seeing Dennis Long on Sunday, who borrows a truck from a friend and delivers all these boxes of food for the deaf and hard of hearing uh, around Shiprock and Arizona, New Mexico, uh, for the community members who have no transport. So thank you so much in supporting this and making this happen. If you want to continue with that, all the virtual events where we're in now, you can make a donation at our website, indigenousways.org, donate, or we've got PayPal, Venmo, or if you're not into any of those electronic circles, which we totally get, uh, you can uh, post a check Indigenous Ways to the post box there. Now, this is really, really exciting. Starting this Saturday, or not Saturday, Friday, we've been working towards uh, the Indigenous Healing Festival, which is on, will be online. We're collaborating with three other organizations, Te Woman United, the Santa Fe Indian School, and also uh, the IAIA, the Institute of American Indian Arts. Uh, we've been coordinating this and we have got a phenomenal festival from Indigenous perspectives. Exactly what's been happening here, instead of for an hour, you get six hours every day of these hip hop extraordinary presenters Buffy. that will be, that will be uh, there for the weekend. So please save the date, May 8th, May 9th. Uh, in ninth is Mother's Day, so you might be able to make both of the events or just one of the events, whichever registrations happening, uh, opening up this Friday. Uh, our guest, our featured artists that or presenters will be Buffy St. Marie uh, and also Keith Sokola, who we've also had through the virtual events. The theme is survivance. And so one of the things that I wanted to share with you uh, this evening is uh, if you want to be a part of this, be sure to register. We've got limited tickets. <coughs> uh, if you want to hear straight off the bat, go to our website, which is down the bottom here, indigenousways.org, uh, to get the newsletter because you'll get the blast. Uh, we're going to be holding that uh, for <coughs> a couple of days before blasting it out to all our social media networks. Um, so uh, that's what's going on. We're very excited. And as I said, if you want to share about this, um, we're doing, you might want to do a um, 15 second video presentation on what survivance has meant for you. I've just thrown that in the chat box for those people who are in Zoom. For people on um, all our social media networks, I'm going to toss that in as well with all the addresses um, there. But uh, making a video, so when you're doing the video, uh, your little selfie, just be sure the video is long ways, oblong, horizontal, and then take a selfie video of your survivance, which is the theme. And survivance, if you haven't looked it up, it's about resilience and which Gabby was talking about and her history and also survival. I mean, gosh, we survived COVID. We're still here, which is extraordinary in itself. So whether you talk and share about your last year or you want to share about your historical survivance, which is really extraordinary. So uh, 15 second videos and in the breaks, 
in our festival. We're going to share those videos, uh, which will be which will be also going globally if you want to do that. Um, but anyway, that's it from me. Thank you. Anybody have any last minute burning desires you want to say to Gabby before we sign off for the night? Thank you from Donna. We just absolutely love you. We'll see you, uh, everybody, Saturday. Uh, thank you all, Zoom, social media, live people that have joined us today on Facebook and Instagram. Those watching the recording in the future, in the next 24 to 48 hours, you will be able to see this uh, video on our website. ASL interpreters, wow. You're raising the bar in a big way for our Native American deaf and hard of hearing audiences. Thank you. We love you. Thank you, Zoe. Thank, Thank you, Zoe, you Kaylee, Kaylee for, tonight. for tonight. And we'll see you on Saturday the 17th. We've got Pete Sands, Navajo folk singer, uh, filmmaker. He has his own film company. And lastly, let's give a big shout out. Thank you to Gabby Tayak and put a you. DR before her name. She earned it. Let's say Dr. Gabby. We love you. <laughs> Touch the earth. Touch the earth Yeah.